Welcome and thank you for joining me on this YouTube channel. I appreciate you doing this and if you have any comments or suggestions uh, about anything concerning this channel, I appreciate hearing from you in the comments section. While well, recapping today thus far in the book of Ruth, it's been a story about living under worldly wisdom. It's been a story that has focused on self-preservation and doing what seems best in our own eyes and in our own understanding. And we contrast this to living under relationship with God and having our faith, hope, and trust all in God, thus living at the mercy of God. In this little brief book of Ruth, it begins with a famine in Bethlehem, where a family by the name of Elimelech and Naomi are living. There's this final goodbye that happens uh, between her daughter-in-laws with Ruth and Orpah. But Ruth chooses to stay with Naomi and moves back to Bethlehem with her. In Bethlehem, Ruth is a foreigner and an outsider. She is a pagan and a Gentile. Yet, we see signs of her acceptance and turning to Naomi's God. Back in Bethlehem, the prospects for surviving are still poor. Naomi continues to be very bitter, and Ruth goes out to glean in the harvest fields. She's a hard worker. She happens to glean in the fields of a landowner by the name of Boaz, and she begins to experience protection under the wings of God. Now, Boaz re is revealed to be a relative, a kinsman to Elimelech. He offers Ruth free reign to glean along with his workers and provides protection and sustenance to her as well. He is kind, he is generous, and he's respected. Naomi begins to see a glimmer of hope, for she knows that in the law of Moses, it provided a welfare program for the poor, allowing for this gleaning of the harvest fields. She's also aware of the law of redemption in Israel, which provided a way by which a family could redeem property and keep it in the family. There was also the law of the Leverite ma marriage that provided a way for a widow who had no son could request the next of kin to take her and raise children to continue the family bloodline. Naomi is realizing that there were possible blessings on the horizon she comes to realize that Boaz is a relative, a kinsman, and therefore there was an opportunity to regain the family properties lost by her deceased husband 10 years earlier, and also a chance for Ruth to have a new life as well. She's beginning to turn from me, myself, and I, and she's beginning to turn from focusing only on herself to looking out and helping Ruth. She's beginning to think of better prospects for Ruth and for herself. Ruth proposes marriage to Boaz under the law of the Leverite marriage and also to redeem the family line and property. Boaz agrees, but there's an obstacle. There's another closer relative. Naomi and Ruth can only wait for Boaz to resolve the obstacle. Would Ruth end up with Boaz or this mysterious closer relative? So now we pick up the events as we start out in chapter 4 today. Boaz wastes no time in seeking a resolution on Ruth's behalf. We read in Ruth chapter 4, the first two verses. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, my friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Now the town gate was the place where meetings were held 
and legal business would be transacted. And Boaz soon encounters the other kinsman redeemer in this location. We never discover his name. We never discover um, any other clues about him. The narrator doesn't give us any. And so this near kinsman became, remains a stranger and one without name. We pick it up in verse 3. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. You see, Boaz tells the closer kinsman that Naomi has a field she needs to sell in order to survive. If a kinsman redeemer buys it, he can, it can remain in the family. Boaz points out that he could add it to his own inheritance. You're the first in line, so are you interested, he's asking. It sounds like a good deal, and this stranger kinsman agrees to buy it. We continue in verse 5. Then Boaz says, On the day you buy it, the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Maelon's from the hand of Naomi. After the stranger kinsman agrees to buy the field, you see, Boaz adds, by the way, one more thing. When you acquire the field, along with it comes Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of the dead man, whose field it was. So Boaz is pointing out to him that along with the property purchase, he would have to marry Ruth in order to raise up a child who would inherit it. <laughs> oh, oh, not such a good deal after all. Now it meant not just the real estate deal, but also social assistance. It meant supporting Ruth and her mother-in-law and the prospect of children, bringing more responsibility, more mouths to feed, all with the possibility of losing the land to one of the children. Suddenly, the unknown kinsman is not too keen on this deal. We continue in verse 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Maelon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Epirthath and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. You see, this would preserve the names of Elimelech and Maalon with their inheritance. The townspeople pronounce a blessing upon Boaz for him to have children, to prosper, to be famous in Bethlehem. And so Ruth chapter 4 is all about preserving names and the family. As we continue in verse 13, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom, and, he be, and became a nurse to him. 
Also the neighbor women gave him a name saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, although neither Boaz nor the stranger realized it, but the one who took on the kinsman redeemer was creating a lasting name. The one who ended up marrying Ruth received not only a woman of character with an impressive work ethic, but also received a place in God's plan. The line of Boaz would now reach all the way towards David, Bethlehem's most famous, a king after God's own heart, and then on to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God's math is not like our math. We often evaluate decisions in life according to our scales. What's in it for me? Will it fulfill me? Will I enjoy it? What will it cost me? We calculate and protect ourselves and insist that two plus two can only ever equal four. And in so doing this kind of arithmetic, we end up with the wrong answer because we have left out God. We have left him out of the equation. We can therefore never discover what God has in store for our blessings. You see, the book of Ruth is about how God's kingdom operates on a different type of mathematics in which the way to fullness runs through emptiness. The kinsman redeemer stranger clung to what he had, and as a result, he lost far more. Naomi, also in years earlier, had lost all the things she hung on to for her earthly fullness. And yet her loss of all that was dear to her was part of a greater purpose and a greater plan. Had Naomi not lost all, we would never have come to know her. She would never have come to appreciate Ruth and Ruth's true worth. She would not have grown in her own understanding of God. She had to lose her two sons in order to appreciate the one who was better than seven sons. Her losses and suffering were necessary for her spiritual growth and her place in God's plan. You see, Boaz, however, was an A student in God's math. He had an open heart for the poor to start off with. He wasn't marrying Ruth for what he could get out of the deal. In financial terms and in social standing, it was a losing prospect. Entering into a relationship with the possibility of a son who would take away by inheritance what he had just bought made no worldly sense. It's all about putting what the Lord thinks before what the world thinks. Did you hear that? It's about putting what the Lord thinks before what the world thinks. Boaz's reward lay in having respect from the people gathered at the gate Although Ruth had been unable to bear a son for Maelon, she bears one for Boaz. It was a blessing from the Lord. For Naomi, this son would also be a comfort for her. She becomes the child's nurse. The grandson on Naomi's lap was a clear sign that the emptiness she felt at the end of the first chapter has now been replaced by a fullness through God's grace. You see, we too have a kinsman redeemer. Just as Ruth needed a kinsman redeemer and God provided, we need a kinsman redeemer and God has provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Boaz was a kinsman. Jesus became a man to be our kinsman. Boaz was very wealthy. Jesus be being God, he owns everything. All things are at his disposal. Boaz was a respected man. We can read of, of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. Therefore God exhaust, exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Boaz invited Ruth to join him at his meal table. Revelation chapter 3, 20, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Boaz had the resources to be able to make Ruth his wife. 
He wanted to buy back the property, but he also wanted the person. He wanted Ruth as well. You see, Jesus also has the resources to buy the person. Sin is the debt that none of us are able to pay. It requires a perfect sacrifice in order to fulfill its demands. And Jesus, God himself, sinless, bears our sin on that cross at Calvary and was able to make full payment for all of sin and for our sp sin specifically. And when we as a sinner trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus on that cross, we become a redeemed member of the family of God. We become part of his kingdom. We come into a relationship with him. You see, Jesus specializes in taking old hell-bound sinners, saving them by his grace, and transforming them into a child of God. When he pays the price, he purchases the whole person. As the writer of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 tells us, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. You see, as we end the book of Ruth, the poor hurt heathen girl is now the bride of a wealthy redeemer. My, how things have changed for Ruth. The book op opens with a funeral. It closes with a wedding. But I want you to notice one thing with me right now. Notice what we are told about these two and their relationship. It tells us between Ruth and Boaz there is an intimacy that is now possible that was not possible before. Boaz is able to take Ruth into his arms and love her. You see, all the barriers that were between them have been removed. They were separated by race, social status, morals, etc. But now they are one. She is as rich as he is. She is able to have fellowship of the most intimate kind with Boaz. They have been brought together in an intimate relationship. And you see, my friends, this is what each of us have when Jesus Christ saves us. When we repent of our sin, receive the forgiveness of our sin because of what Christ has paid on that cross of Calvary. You who were once separated from God in any relationship with him because of our sin and our poverty are now brought near to him in a most intimate relationship. We become as rich as he is. All that is his is ours. We are no longer separated. We can have that intimate relationship with God in Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. No longer doomed. We are no longer poverty stricken. We are no longer as good as dead. Now we live in Jesus as he lives in us and we can rest in him. We can experience the intimacies of his redeeming love. You see, without Jesus, we were lost. We were separated. With him, we are found and brought into a family relationship with God, becoming his child. You see, the book of Ruth is a most wonderful story. It takes us from emptiness through hardship to coming under the wings of God and entering a life of fullness. And so I must ask, I need to ask, how about you? How about you? Have you been found? Has God found you? Have you entered a life of fullness, coming under his wings, under his protection, resting in him? You see, this is a story of God's salvation. Ruth is a wonderful story. Is it your story? And if it isn't already your story, I encourage you to make it your story. If it is your story, then be thankful and realize, realize how special the relationship is that you have with God. In Jesus, how everything is looked after, how you can trust and rest in him. The concerns of life and where it is leading and going are not ours anymore. Trust him, leave it with him and the blessings will come. This is the story of God's salvation in the book of Ruth. I pray that you have this salvation in and through 
that can only be received in Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for each person who has been listening, who will look to this very small, brief little book, but realize your love of how you can take this life that often is very difficult and hard, and you can use all of this if we would only turn to you and trust you, have faith in you, that you bring us into a relationship with you in which you will look after everything, that in the end, it will all be according to your plan and your purposes. May we trust you with all of our life, allowing our life to become your life. Come Lord Jesus, I pray. Bless everyone here today. Amen. Amen.